fixed upon you, not afraid, only trusting. Held by your hand, my soul is secure through the storm, through the testing. Under your wings, my refuge will be until these winds have passed over me. Like a child who fears no alarm, quietly trusting in all that you are, quietly trusting in all that you are. Give me a mind that stayed upon you, not afraid, simply Never to fear at troublesome news, though it tries to overwhelm me. Under your wings, your wings will be refuge until these winds have passed over me. Like a child who fears no alarm, quietly trusting in all that you are. Quietly trusting in all that you are. Quietly trusting. Quietly I am trusting. There is a place that's waiting for me. Sure. It is Thank you, ladies. Appreciate the good number and the good words to the song. I want us to consider a scripture this morning found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll begin reading with verse 8. And this parallels uh, with the uh, passage that we read earlier uh, concerning the judgment. The judgment seat of Christ. And... We've been considering the judgments, and we're going to consider the judgment this morning of the Christian. Um, the Bible mentions this in several places. We'll not be able to look at all of them, um, but um, the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work 
of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that the words that we share today will be that which will cause us to focus upon you, to rejoice in you, and to serve you faithfully. So may I say everything that needs to be said and nothing that shouldn't be said. And may everything that's said be not only heard, but acted upon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a dirty word that appears several times in the passage that we just read. Sometimes when we think about a dirty word, we think of profanity, uh, some curse word. Um, but this word is a word that oftentimes uh, people don't view very highly, especially in our modern world, it seems. It's hard to find the kind of people that will honor this word. Most people today, and I'm not saying you, but many people... Uh, don't think of this word in a proper way, especially in their relationship to the Lord. Now, if you haven't picked up the word yet, it appears several times in the passage. It is a little four-letter word. <laughs> it's the word work. Work. If any man's work, or it is referred to sometimes as labors, um, he that laboreth uh, his own work, uh, not somebody else's, but his own work will be judged. We've been considering the judgment in the book of Revelation and the people of Israel. Um, and much of the book of Revelation deals with the lost and those who are unsaved. But this morning, we're going to consider the judgment, not of the unsaved, but the judgment of those who are believers. Who are the people that are judged? Well, verse 9, notice he says, For we, Paul includes himself. So apparently he's referring to those who are saved, born again, believers. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. So you belong to the you belong to God. You are his building, he says. So according to the grace of God which is given unto me. So if the grace of God has been given to you, you are one of his children. So he apparently is talking to those who are born again. Uh, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay, which is Jesus Christ. So the people who are judged at this judgment seat we're going to consider here are believers. Now notice, secondly, when they're going to be judged. Well, you're not judged today. You may be expecting a check at the end of the week or at the end of the month, but um, we don't get our payment so much here as we do later. Now, not to say that God doesn't reward us for our faithfulness here. He does. But of course, the final reward, the final giving of this uh, judgment or reward is found in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. And behold, he said, speaking of the Lord, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his, and there's the bad word again, work. According to our work shall be given to us. So it will happen when? When the Lord appears. So when the Lord appears and takes his church out, those who are believers, at that point there will be a judgment, a rewarding. Now, I want us to consider just three thoughts from the passage here in 1 Corinthians. Concerning the judgment seat, there will be a great revealing. Look at verse 13. Now, there are three words that I want us to pay close attention to 
that have to do with the idea of revealing. So at this great judgment seat of believers, at the coming of the Lord, there will be a revealing. Notice it. Verse 13. Every man's work. All right. So what is going to be revealed here are our works in this life. Every man's work shall be manifest. Notice that word manifest. For the day shall, what? Declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now let's consider those three words. Manifest, declare, and revealed by fire. Now notice the word manifest. They all have to do with revealing. If something is manifest, it is revealed. Now the word manifest is the Greek word that means literally to shine upon. Um, the word phaneros, it's kind of as you would take a flashlight and shine upon an object. That's the word manifest. Or it has to do with to reveal or to shine upon so that the public, so everybody can see abroad and make it appear to all who are there to open to make outward is the idea of manifest. Now, an example of this would be, um, I'll think back maybe a few days um, and think back to um, some sin that you committed. Now, maybe no one knew about it. Only you knew about it in God. Let's say it's, it's a deed that takes place in the dark. It's, it is dark, maybe not physically dark, but it's dark as far as anybody else being able to see what you did. But suppose I showed up when you were committing that sin. And I have everybody here in the congregation this morning are with me. You're sitting here in the dark. You're committing your sin. You think nobody sees. And all of a sudden, I put a light on you and reveal to everybody what, you do, what you're doing. That's the meaning of the word manifest. Now, I cannot do that. I did not do that. Uh, but there will come a time when that will happen. Notice he says, our works shall be shined upon so that everybody it will be able to see what we've done. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 4 that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee what? Openly. So everybody's going to see. Mark chapter 4 verse 22. For there is nothing hid that shall not be manifest. Neither was anything kept secret that it should come abroad. So everybody abroad will be able to see. That's the meaning of the word manifest. So every man's work shall be made manifest, shined upon. Now, let's look at the second word in verse 13. The word declare. The word declare here is the word delu. It means literally to make plain by words. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11. For it hath been declared. Now there's that word again. It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So Paul now finds out that there's been some contentions among the people in the church. And what does Paul do? He declares. He makes plain what these people were doing by words. Now, 
Suppose I happened, I don't, but let's suppose I happen to know about some sin that you committed last week. Nobody else knows but me and you. Now, when I declare it, what am I doing? I am making it plain by words to other people what you did. That's kind of like a witness in a courtroom. Uh, they declare by words. They don't actually have maybe a video of it, like the shining of the light on it, but you have the ability to declare by words what has happened. Um, now, notice the next word in verse 13, the word revealed. So every man's work shall be manifest, shine the light upon, it will be declared publicly, it will be revealed. Now, the word revealed is the word ak apokolopto, and it literally means to take the cover off. Or that is to disclose. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 26. For fear them not therefore. For there is nothing covered. And that's that word revealed. Same word. That shall not be revealed. And hid that shall not. Be known. Now notice three words there. The word covered, revealed, and hid. The idea is that whatever you have done, whatever you have, what kind of work you have performed, it will be revealed to everybody. Now, you say, preacher, <laughs> that is scary stuff you're talking about. Well, I agree. Pretty scary stuff. I'll be honest with you. I, I would not want all my sins revealed to everybody else here. I would not. But listen, I have great news for you. If you are a believer, that is. Now, if you're not a believer, it's totally different. You're... Your sins will be revealed and all of them. But if you are a believer, the revealing is not going to be of your sins. Notice Psalm 103. Here's the great news, verse 10. If you are a believer, He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, you can't get any further than that, so far hath He removed my transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. Our sins will not be revealed. Isaiah 43, verse 25, I, even I, Am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake. I will not remember thy sins. Good news. So there will not be a manifestation, a shining of the light upon your sin. It will not be declared. It will not be revealed. It is forgotten. It is gone. Now, the question is, how did he make this possible? How did, it, how did it happen that our sins are blotted out and not remembered? Glad you asked. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us, For he hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God. So even though I am a sinner, I have been declared made righteous by him, it says. Romans 5, 19, For as by one man's disobedience, that is Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that is Christ, shall many be made righteous. 
Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. So he bore our iniquities. 1 Peter 2.24. Who his own self bear our sins. So he bore the sin so that you won't have to. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. 1 John 3, 5. For we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. So how is it possible that your sins will not be Manifest, declared, revealed, because He bore it for you. Now, but you say, what about this judgment? The Bible says that there's going to be a judgment of the believer. What is that judgment going to reveal? Not your sin, but it will reveal your works. Remember that word? So this judgment seat is going to be a revealing of your works. Verse 13. Notice it. Every man's what? Work. Not his sin, but his works. Like the talents that are given to us. Our works will be made obvious, manifest, revealed, declared, to everyone. So this judgment is a place of revealing your works for the Lord. Now, at this judgment seat, once it has been revealed, your works, there will be a reward given. Notice verse 14 of our text. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? A reward. Now, I want to show you a picture of two paths. All right. Um, I suppose most every day you and I, we come to a place where we have to make a choice. We can go one way or we can go the other way. Now, let's say that the arrow that's pointing, the red arrow pointing one way, that path, you, you look back and you say, well, I don't know what's down the road. Either way, I don't know. But let's suppose that I could reveal to you, now listen carefully, if I could reveal to you what lies at the end of the road that's marked with a red arrow. If I should say to you, you know, down that way, it's not a good way. And if you go that way, you're going to lose a lot of money. If you make that choice, you're going you're gonna to suffer a loss. Now, but if you take the one going the other way toward the blue arrow, if you go that way, what? I mean, you make that investment and you are going to, I mean, it'll be a hundredfold. <laughs> you, you put in just a little bit and you're going to get back your cup just running over. Now, which one would you choose? Well, I, I don't think there's any question about which one you would choose. No one wants to lose everything they've got, go bankrupt. You, you, but now I can't do that. Or can I? Um, let me show you this next picture. Today you've heard a lot about insider trading. Uh, insider trading is, uh, okay, let's say you have some stock you've invested in um, and the, your person in, in the know, he finds out that this stock is going to crash and that 
tomorrow this, this is going to be a bad deal. So he calls on the phone and he says, look, you, you better cash in now while the stock is at a high level because tomorrow it's going down. That's insider trading. It's illegal. Or if he calls you on the phone and this stock is selling at a really low price and he knows that tomorrow it's going to go way, way up and he calls you and tells you that. Insider trading. Now listen, humanly speaking, that's illegal. But I want to tell you something. God is on the phone and he can tell you ahead of time what you need to invest in. He can tell you exactly what your reward's going to be over there if you will do such and such here. He knows the scoop, so to speak. And there is a reward promise to those who perform the work as he directs. There will be a reward. Labors will be manifest. They will be declared. They will be revealed. There will be a reward for those who go in the direction that God says go. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 4. That, my, that thine alms, or that is thy doings, that they're giving, what you do. That thine alms may be in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall do what? Reward thee openly. So when you labor here, you can bank on what God has said. You will be rewarded. It will may, may be made known to everyone. What you did when nobody was watching for the Lord, God will one day make it declared, manifest, revealed to all. So labors will be made manifest. Labor, secondly, that are proven to be good, that is. Not all labors are good labors. But labors that are proven good will be rewarded. Look at, in, in Matthew, we read it a while ago, in Matthew 25 and verse 19, it says, after a long time, the Lord of that servant cometh and reckoneth with them. Remember, the, the, the owner of the vineyard, he, he leaves. He, he leaves with responsibility to those that he has given authority. And when he returns, then he reckons with those that he has given responsibility to. Back to our text, 1 Corinthians 3.13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall do what? It shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that is the foundation of Christ, your salvation, Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. So we have several things mentioned here that you can build upon your life, upon your salvation. It, it can be something like gold, not, not physical gold, but things that are like gold, silver, precious stones. Now, what are... What are what is gold, silver, and precious stones? You can put them to the fire, but it may change them for a moment. But you know, they're going to be, when it, when it cools, it's going to still be gold, silver, and precious stone. But when you put wood, hay, and stubble in the fire, it's going to change it completely and it's not going to return to its previous form. <laughs> right? 
uh, let's say if your house, this while you're here at church, let's say your house catches on fire, forbid it be so, but let's suppose your house catches on fire. And when you pull in the driveway, it's all gone. But the gold that you have hidden in the closet somewhere or under the mattress or the silver that you have buried somewhere or the precious diamonds and rubies and all those good things that you own, I mean, you, you can look around and you're probably going to be able to find them. Now, they might be charred a little bit, but they're still going to be there. You say, I wish that was true, preacher. Well, it is true if you are placing an emphasis upon the right kind of works. The point that Paul is making here is that your labor will be put to the test when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if your labors, your work, has been the right kind of work, it will stand the test. Now notice he says of what sort it is. In other words, what kind of work did you do? Not how big it was. What, what you do, you might not consider very big. You, you think of somebody who's a great missionary, who's given their life and who's doing all these wonderful things and built great churches and great ministries. That's not what you're rewarded for. Notice he says, of what sort it is. Not the size, but the sort. The kind. I'm convinced that God will reward the laborer of that mother who's been faithful in bringing that child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That person who is, well, the Bible says, if you even so much as give a cup of cold water in my name, you'll receive a reward for it. So it's not how big something is, but the manner in which it's given, the motive behind it, the desire to honor the Lord in it. And that's what this judgment is all about. It is to prove, to test our works. And when it is tested, and when it comes through the fire, and it still remains, it wasn't burned up because it was just foolish stuff. Notice what happens. At this judgment, rewards will be given. Matthew 25, verse 21. His Lord said unto him, what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou's been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of Thy Lord. Now notice two rewards that are mentioned here. One, he says, I'll make you a ruler. If your works are good works and they stand the test, I'll make you a ruler over many things. Notice the second reward, the joy of the Lord. And I think that's probably the greatest reward of all. To be rewarded by having the joy of the Lord. Did you see that in the news? And I'm not a big follower, as some are, of the royal family. Uh, but maybe you've heard about Prince Harry and his wife, you know, how they left England and how they came here to the States. Um, they kind of pulled away from the royal family. Um, and they live now in California. Now, Maybe you saw the picture I'm going to show you here of their new house. $15 million house they bought. Now, you say, wow, that's quite a house. And I saw some pictures of the inside that are really quite beautiful. Big, nice swimming pool. All the luxuries that, you know, could probably be had are there. 
But you know what? Prince Harry has a lease on that house. You say, oh, no, he owns it. No, he has a lease. He may have the lease, but you who are believers have the deed. You own it. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, let me give you a verse for that. In Psalm 37 and verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off. And I'm not saying that he's an evildoer, but for the point here. But those that wait, or that is trust, upon the Lord, they shall inherit what? The earth. And I think that includes California and all the other 49 states and all the rest of the earth. It says, that's what it says, right? But those that trust in the Lord, they shall own it. You're going to own. That is your reward for faithfully working, laboring for the Lord. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, Jesus said. They shall inherit the earth. So if you want a beautiful house, if you want to rule, if you want to have the joy of the Lord, if you want a reward, then labor now. And you'll get it. Well, you say, but preacher, eh, you know, I don't really care about rewards. I don't think that's true, but let's say you say, I don't really care about getting a reward when I get to heaven. Oh, that sounds really pious. Doesn't it? I'll just be satisfied with getting into heaven. Well, getting into heaven, that's, that's a great thing. You will make it to heaven. If you are a born-again believer, you've actually put your trust in Christ, repented of your sins, and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood, you will make it to heaven. Whether you do anything here or not matters little as far as that's concerned. You'll make it to heaven. But you know what? When you get there, when I get there, if we have no works to follow us, there will be, and get this next word, write it on your mind, don't forget it, there will be at the judgment seat regret. Look back at our text again in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians and verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, it's Wood, hay, stubble. It, it, those things, it really doesn't, don't matter. Things that you did not do for the Lord. You did it for yourself. You did it because, well, you enjoy it now. It burn, will burn up. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself should be saved, yet so is by fire. You know, I've probably said it to some of you. I often tell people when they've lost a loved one that they will regret having not done something for that loved one when they had the chance. When they didn't say what they should have said when they had the chance. And I'll often tell people, you know, don't, don't dwell on that. I mean, all of us, when we lose a precious person, we all tend to think back, oh, well, I could have done more, I could have done this, I could have been kinder, I could have done... You know, that, that doesn't profit anything for you, really. I think all of us come to that. It's only natural for us to regret 
when we failed or when we said something we shouldn't have or when we should have said more. Uh, for example, uh, my mother, and I hope I can get through this <laughs> without getting too emotional, but my mother, when uh, after my dad passed away, um, as you that knew, and those of you that knew them know that they really loved each other. I mean, they had a tremendous love for each other and respect for each other. But when my dad passed away and mom was alone, um, there were times uh, when uh, she would call me on the phone and she, she'd say, well, Joel, can you meet me for lunch? Can we go up to Wendy's? Can we go out and get something to eat? And there were times when I, I would say, well, I, I'm sorry, Mom, I just finished eating. <laughs> I, that happened several times. I, you know, or there were times when she'd call and say, can we go out to lunch? And I'd have to say, well, you know, Mom, I'm sorry, but I'm really busy right now. I, I, I've got this going on. I, I'm doing this and that. I just can't do it today. You know what? If I had it to do over again, I'd stuff my gut until it popped, and I wouldn't say anything about having already eaten, just to have the chance to do it again. But I can't. Listen. Listen. I can assure you that when you look on the scarred face of the crucified one, the one who died and paid for your sins and bore them on his body on the tree, when you see him, you will wish you had done more to serve him. There will be regret. I am sure that when I stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to have some regrets. I already have some. But I know they're going to be even much bigger then. I can remember when I have failed to labor for the Lord and witnessing to someone. And that person died without Christ. I regret that. I regret when I didn't say something that I should have said or I said something that I shouldn't have. But when I stand at the judgment seat and my works are manifest, not my sin, but when my works are declared, when they are revealed, I'm going to have some regrets. There's a song that was written back back in 1948. It goes something like this. I wish I had given him more. More, so much more. More of my love than I ever gave before. By and by when he holds out his hands, I wish I had given him more. In the light of that heavenly place, light from his face, beautiful face. In the light of that heavenly place, I wish I had given him more. It will be a place of regret. But it will be a place of reward when our labors are revealed and pass through the fire of judgment. Let's stand to our feet, please.